Okay, hello. Um, all right, so I'm going to start by talking about angels. <laughs> The Thomistic theory of angels. Um, the Th uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, is uh, his kind of nickname is the angelic doctor. <laughs> um, I guess it's I don't know if this is true or not that he's called that because of his contribution to angelology, which is. <laughs> I mean, um, among a million other things, is probably the most original part of his thought. Um, but um, okay, so background of this: so an angel is an immaterial substance. I mean. How do we know that an angel is an immaterial substance? It's a good question, right? Like the Bible doesn't describe angels as immaterial substances. <laughs> um, uh, and well, I guess I'll say more about that uh, when we get to the disagreement between Thomas and Maimonides. But in any case, the situation now, I guess, is that, uh, you know, I guess this equivalence has been established by Augustine and Boethius and other people in late antiquity. And Thomas Aquinas is basically faced with, with this, that like angels equals immaterial substances. So, um, so remember, I mean, so an immaterial substance or an intelligible substance, right, as opposed to sensible. So, immaterial or intelligible. This is really like, this is the Aristotelian term and this is the Platonic term, basically, right? So versus material, sensible, the bodies. So, I mean, so first of all, remember how these two things are related to each other in Plotinus. So that, you know, there's the immaterial intelligible substance, uh, which has true being. Um, and then there's like these kind of pseudo substances down here that are called substances because they're images of this. Right, remember that's what Plotinus said about sensible substances. He says, you know, uh, really they're not substances. Really, these are the true substances, but these are called substances because they're images of them. Um, so this is a relationship of imaging, of uh, resemblance in a certain way, uh, emanation of being. Right, this derives its being from this. Um, right, so like in other words, the, these are what Plotinus will also call them platonic forms. I mean, we won't say platonic, we'll just say forms, but <laughs> um, uh, so uh, you know, I mean, the other thing that happens is that this gets dispersed, right? It has many enemies, but I'm not going to focus on that here because that's the exact thing that's not going to be relevant to. Um, to the later developments, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, also this is called uh, exemplary or paradigmatic causation. This is the exemplary cause of this. It's the paradigmatic cause of that. So that's the relationship between an immaterial substance and material substance. Okay, on the other hand, we have this Aristotelian idea of the relationship between them. Um, so actually, maybe I should erase angels for now. Uh, so the Aristotelian 
idea of the relationship between them is, right? So there's these celestial spheres, right? Here's the Earth in the middle, the sublunar world, right? Including the Earth, water, and air, and the fire <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and then around it are the celestial spheres. Um, and the celestial sphere, so motion down here in the sublunar world is ultimately caused by the motion of the celestial spheres. The celestial spheres always keep moving in the same way. Um, but because there's many of them, I guess the relationships between them change and that like mixes everything up down here. And that's how we get all the motion that's down here. Um, but what moves the spheres? So that's where Aristotle brings in the gods, as he calls them, again, which again are immaterial substances. The immaterial substances are the unmoved movers that cause the eternal motion of the spheres. I mean, they, they have to be unmoved because they're not bodies and they're not in space. <laughs> so, um, but they have some kind of power by which they cause this motion. I don't know exactly how to draw this, except here's the immaterial substance which Aristotle is going to call God, this is in, um, this is a God, right? Because uh, Aristotle's interpreting ancient Greek religion, not Christianity or, or Islam or Judaism, right? So he's going to call this a God. And uh, in metaphysics lambda, he calculates exactly how many gods there are by calculating how many spheres there are. Well, he doesn't, I, by, by borrowing from Eudoxus uh, a calculation of how many spheres there are. I think I talked about this before, did I, in this class about retrograde motion and why they needed lots of spheres? Yeah, okay, it doesn't really matter exactly, but there's more spheres than there are planets. There's like 51 or something. <laughs> so that's how many gods there are. Um, and this connection, so right, so, so it's like this connection, as I said, is imaging, uh, paradigmatic causation. This relation is that this is related to the sphere as a motor, <laughs> that is a mover. Right, that's what that's what motor means. Of course, now we use motor specifically for things like like how electric coil inside, whatever. But motor just means a mover, right? So this is related to this as a mover. As I said, it's the unmoved mover of the celestial sphere, and the celestial sphere always moves in the same way. So this thing always does the same thing. <laughs> so it's unchanging, which again you would expect because it's not. Um, like what makes substances down here change is that they have parts and they, you know, they grow and they shrink and they, you know, um, they move their parts around and they move from one place to another. And these immaterial substances don't do any of those things. So, uh, uh, and I guess if they did, you would need another mover beyond them to explain why they move, right? So the whole point is it's unmoved, it's unchanging, and it causes this constant motion. Um, so like um, some of the early, well, I, I mean, some, I guess uh, the, the early medieval theory of angels that you find in Al-Farabi and Maimonides is basically that these are angels. That's what angels are. That's not very well suited to the stories about angels in the Bible, right? Like they don't seem to be so that, you know, the most important one that everyone always quotes, including Thomas, is the angels that appear to Abraham. Um, you know, 
they come and they tell Abraham and Sarah that Isaac is going to be born. And then they leave there and they go to Sodom and they destroy Sodom. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, um, that doesn't sound like something that, that this is doing, right? <laughs> it's not coming down and talking to Abraham and whatever, right? Um, it, it doesn't have a body. <laughs> uh, uh, and moreover, it doesn't change. So, you know, uh, like it can't do something like destroy Sodom. <laughs> so, um, so like this is, so the, the way Maimonides deals with that is he says that, um, well, uh, two things. One is that um, oftentimes when it says angel in the Bible, it doesn't mean one of these things. So like the, the Hebrew word for angel, malach, which is translated into Greek as angelos, right? Both of those words just mean messenger. So Maimonides says many times when it talks about a messenger of God in the Bible, it doesn't mean one of these things. It means either a human messenger of God, that is a prophet, or it means like the forces of nature. Right, so uh, uh, you know, actually, in one of those psalms, it says, "Osem alachav ruchot," he makes the winds his angels, <laughs> messengers. Right, so uh, like uh, my modern, says, a lot of times the word angel or the word malach just means like something that that does God's will. It's not necessarily this. Um, and the other thing he says is that when um, it describes, uh, when the Bible describes prophets as seeing angels or as having angels talk to them, what that really means is that in a vision, um, the, the prophet's intellect received an emanation from the, from the immaterial intelligence as above. <laughs> Right, I guess I should say the lowest one of these, according to Al Farabi and Maimonides, is called the active intellect. And the active intellect kind of like does for the sublunar world what these ones do for the celestial sphere is. I mean, not exactly, but what it does is like supply substantial forms. <laughs> um, so, and and prophets receive prophets, according to Maimonides, are people. Who and I'm saying this this is going to turn out to be super relevant. So it's not just a digression. Prophets, according to Maimonides, and well, you shouldn't really just following Al Farabi. So according to Al Farabi, a prophet is someone who's a philosopher. So they have a really highly developed intellect. This is their intellect, right? The human intellect itself is immaterial, according to what Aristotle seems to say in at least one place, and what most Aristotelians believe. <laughs> Right, so the human intellect itself is not doesn't have an organ, um, but on the other hand, the imagination does have an organ. It's like the heart, according to Aristotle, but according to post galenic people, it's the brain, right? And so the a prophet has a really highly developed intellect, meaning a prophet is a philosopher, and the prophet receives. Uh, like intelligible forms from the active intellect, which really just means the prophet thinks. <laughs> right? I mean, or 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 I guess you could say the other way around, right? That is whatever ha whenever anyone is thinking, the active intellect is involved. This is based on Aristotle's discussion of the active intellect in Book Three of the Dianema. Uh, Thomas and and uh, like most of the Latin people understand Book Three of the De Anima completely differently, and they think that the active intellect is a human faculty, and everyone has an active intellect. But before that, most people thought the active intellect was like a super human entity, right? 
So anyway, so right, so the active intellect transmits forms to the intellect of the prophet, but the prophet also has a really highly developed imagination, unlike a regular philosopher. And the, what the prophet does is translate these intellectual uh, uh, forms into images. And then the images can be um, um, well, I guess, I mean, there's kind of two aspects to it. The prophet translates into images and that allows the prophet to be a lawgiver. Right, like create an image of the perfect city here on earth. This goes back to a passage in the Republic where Plato talks about the philosophers like going up to the world of the forms and then coming back down and painting the city <laughs> as an image. Right. So that, but, but also this allows the prophet to. Uh, instruct people who are not philosophers in intellectual truths by way of uh, imaginative symbols. Um, right, so like, and Thomas actually, well, you know, there's a different story about the active intellect or whatever, but Thomas basically accepts that. I think it, you might notice in one of the readings, he, he, he says something like, just as in the sacred scriptures, intellectual truths are represented in images, right? That's this Al-Farabian theory of prophet, prophecy. It's also based on, it's based on things in Plato and Aristotle, even though um, Plato and especially Aristotle seem to be pretty um, skeptical about prophecy. Right, I mean, of course, the Greeks had prophets too, or, or seers, <laughs> and Aristotle wrote about it, but he seems to be pretty skeptical about it, but later people interpreted it as a, a positive theory of prophecy. <laughs> All right, so, um, right, so anyway, so, so Maimonides says, you know, like, when the Bible talks about an angel speaking to a prophet, it means that the prophet and like most prophets, unless they're really good, don't do this when they're awake. They do this, they do this by sleeping and having a dream that's prompted by the right. So, you know, or even when they're awake, it's it's like a vision. Right. So Maimonides says that when the, you know, when the Bible talks about prophets speaking to angels or whatever, it's talking about a prophetic vision. So thereby, he's able to keep angels as just these things. And he says, as Aristotle does, there's not very many. There's just enough to move the spheres. 51. 51. I mean, I don't know what Maimonides thinks about. I think I also mentioned this before, right, that this Eudoxian astronomy ended up not working out. And Ptolemaic astronomy introduced all kinds of other spheres. But the the or circles anyway that are moving around to other centers so that that's impossible according to Aristotle, and I don't know exactly what Maimonides thinks about that or whether he thinks we really know at all. But anyway, right? So fifty one or whatever it is. Anyway, not very many. So um, okay, but I think um, I mean with Thomas Aquinas, it's. Like he's working with very strict constraints, right? Like there's like I don't think he's allowed to say it. It's already been established that the stories about angels in the Bible are really about angels. <laughs> um, uh, like the opinion that it that it's all symbolic or whatever has been condemned at some you know by by some council or something, right? Um, I don't know the details here. Maybe that's not even true in this case, but I, I think something like that is probably going on. Anyway, like so, so when he gets to this, to, to the, it's actually I didn't include this in the reading, but there's a this is as close I think as I've seen a medieval philosopher actually come to the question of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. I think that's actually due to Moliere, but yeah, but uh, but uh, but it, just the question: How many angels are there? <laughs> that's the that's the, what he's discussing there, and that's where he, like he mentions Maimonides' opinion, and then he says, "But Maimonides 
like um, stuck too strictly to Aristotle, <laughs> right? And then he goes on to explain, you know, his according to his own theory, there is actually a huge. There's more immaterial substances than there are material substances, which he says makes sense because they're better. So why wouldn't God have made more? <laughs> So there's loads and loads of them. Um, so, right, so there's lots of these things. He also explains how even though they're immaterial and in a sense unmoved, there's this kind of change in them. Um, but it's all internal. It's a development of their own internal principle. All right, so this here already we got to something obviously that Leibniz has taken over for his purposes, <laughs> right? The way change is possible in an immaterial thing, which can't be acted on by, by from outside and can't move around in space and whatever is that it can like develop its own internal nature. Um, but he also has to explain um, how they can be in space. Because again, there's this uh, there's these stories about angels going from one place to another, whatever. And you know, he says this was in the reading. He says like we can't say that it's only a vision that they did that, because it's not just Abraham who saw them. Lots of people saw them. So it's like intersubjective. Um, and he says, like, you know, uh, an imagination is something that you, that only one person sees, right? But if many people see the same sensible image, that, that means there's a body there. Now, like, I don't know how strong Thomas thinks that connection is. In Leibniz, that's going to end up being the definition of a body, basically. Right. That is, if many monads have different have images which are different perspectives on the same thing, then that that's what a body is. <laughs> um, so again, I'm not sure like whether Thomas thinks that. In other words, why couldn't it be that all those people simultaneously had corresponding visions, but there was no body there? And I don't think he thinks it's by definition that would be a body, but I, I'm not sure. Anyway, he doesn't, he, he just says, which is a body. <laughs> so, um, but as I said, in, in Leibniz, that's gonna end up meaning automatically there's a body, right? If it's If it's like, visible by by all, to all the different moments. Um, okay, so so there is a body. So like when the angels like I guess walk up to Abraham and then you know walk or fly or whatever they doesn't really say <laughs> how they get to, to Sodom after that. Um, there's actual bodies that are doing this. So Thomas has to explain right so he has to explain how they change um you know uh but he also has to explain how they can be present in space and um So they can't be present in space the way a body is present in space, right? The way a body is present in space is that it's surrounded by a surface, meaning like the way Aristotle understands this is the surface of the surrounding bodies. And I guess, I mean, also the way Descartes understands it and Spinoza too, right? Even though according to Spinoza, it's not a substance, but it's still the same story. The way a body is present in space is that it 
its its place is the surface of the surrounding bodies. That's the way Aristotle defines place. Right. So when you ask, in what place is this body? The answer is it's it's in the place that consists of the surfaces of the surrounding bodies. Um, but uh, an angel doesn't have or isn't a body. It's an immaterial substance. So it's not surrounded by surfaces. It, it can't touch surfaces. <laughs> Um, so how is it present in space? And this is the theory of virtual presence. How this is related to our like contemporary use of virtual in this context, I, I'm not sure, like, historically speaking. Um, but uh, vir so virtual presence means um, that um the angel is present where it's it's virtus where it's so remember i said this is this this was used to translate the greek word arete which means like virtue excellence <laughs> virtue in that sense but it was also used to translate the greek word dynamis which means uh power or force or potentiality, right? But it's used mostly in context where, where, we, would, where we would want to translate dynamis as force or power, right? So the angel is where its power is being exerted. Um, so like, um, you know, that's that can already be used here. And I think people did use it here, right? Like if you can say that even though this isn't a body, you can say where it is. Where is it? It's where this sphere is. Because that's where its power is acting. But of course, this kind of angel that like changes um, can, th this, this kind of angel, its power is always acting in exactly the same way in exactly the same place. But this kind of angel that changes its power, like can act in different places at different times. Um, um, so like, so as far as this goes, this is kind of just like a continuation of this, this kind of relationship between an angel and a body, right? The, the motor relationship, right? Or, you know, like, I mean, if you take motion in a broad Aristotelian sense to include all kinds of change, not just change in place, right? So like when the angels destroy Sodom, they're causing motion, they're causing change in um, uh, some, and since their power is finite, as Thomas says, th this is actually, there's um, a little bit of a gap here or maybe actually just a difference in thinking about how things can approach infinity between ancient and modern, right? So, but Thomas says, since their power is finite, they can't exert it everywhere. Right, Leibniz is gonna say they can exert it everywhere as long as it like drops off to zero as it goes to infinity. <laughs> That's why I say it may actually, the fact that Leibniz is one of the inventors of the calculus, that, you know, and believes in infinites infinitesimals or whatever, pro probably relevant to it. But in any case, right, so Thomas says, well, since their power is finite, they can't act everywhere. And wherever they are acting, that's their place, right? So it could be small. The angel itself is indivisible, obviously, because divisibility is, is basically the same thing as extension, right? The, the angel itself is indivisible, um, but its place, Thomas says, some people have thought since the angel is indivisible, its place must be a point. But he says, that's, that's a mistake. Its place can be really big. It's, but it still counts as one place because we're comparing it all to the power of the one angel. 
right? So if, I mean, there's actually three angels in the story, but suppose one angel is destroying Sodom, right? So then like all of Sodom is the place, is the one place that angel is in. So it's in a big place. Um, but there's a way in which that place is indivisible, it's similar to the way that Bucephalus is indivisible into horses, right? Like this place isn't divisible into angel places. It's all one angel place. Um, but uh, that's uh, still not good enough for Thomas's purposes because we don't like he doesn't only want to explain how angels can have a place. He wants to explain how a certain body can be the body of the angel. So, um, so he doesn't want to say, right, like, again, the earlier people, I think if you ask them, you know, um, the, the earlier people would say that in some sense, this intellect is the intellect of this body. I mean, the, the celestial spheres also have their own souls, according to, to Al-Farabi and I guess my mom. Christians say that, that the celestial bodies are, are dead. They don't have souls because that has, has to do with polemics against ancient astral piety or whatever but anyway never, never mind that so um so yeah i mean in a way you could say this is the intellect of this body so you could sort of say this is its body but this relationship is obviously not very um satisfactory for right like there's if if you say abraham saw the angel you want it to mean more than just abraham saw some random place where the angel's power was was being exerted Right, I mean, because in that case, you might as well say, like, if someone saw Sodom, they also that they saw the angel, that Sodom was the angel's body, but that's not what we want to say, right? We want to say that the angel actually assumed a body, as Thomas puts it. So this motor relationship is not close enough, basically. But on the other hand, the like strong relationship there is between a human intellect and, and the other parts of the human soul and our body is too close. Right? We don't want to say that the angel becomes the form of a body in some way. So what can we add to um, to the motor relationship to make this body the angel's body and the answer is so right so the, right this is basically the motor thing again but then um for an assumed body so the angel is virtually present in the assumed body right the angel is making it move or whatever but in addition it's Representation is the relationship between the angel and its assumed body, right? And, and Thomas uses this term, representation. I don't know actually what the history of that is. I mean, I, I do know a lot of times people think it like started with Descartes or something. And I know that's not true because you can see here it is, but I don't know where he got it from. Yeah. So in terms of like what the assumed body is, is it just a way to make clear that the relationship between the mind and the body of an angel is more distant than the relationship between a human mind and a human body? Or does it mean something more? Is it just like a, a matter of degree or is it like a whole different thing? In a well, it's, and yeah, it's a whole different thing, at least as, right? I mean, that is, it's a whole different thing according to the way Aristotelians think the human mind is related to the human body. The human mind is related to the human body 
um, very closely because the human mind uh, is the substantial form of the body. So the like if in abstraction from that, the body, the human body is just body, generically speaking, right? It's only the, the soul that, I mean, I shouldn't say mind, right? Because it's the whole soul. It's a nutritive soul and whatever, right? But the, the, the human soul is, is the specific form of, of this body. So, um, um, so without it, it's uh, like, there isn't anything independent that can exist without it. Okay, and with an assumed body, there is something independent. The soul right. of the angel is a whole other thing that can exist separate from the body that the angel is assuming. Well, the, the important thing actually is that the body could exist. <laughs> okay. Right? okay. Because right, that is the, that the, the, a human soul can exist separately from a human body. I mean, it, it depends exactly who you ask, but everyone except a few people like Galen, who, who you know, he really is a materialist, but most, he's not a strict Aristotelian either, but he's pretty Aristotelian. But like most Aristotelians agree at least that the human intellect, because it's not in an organ, that is not, is, not corruptible and it continues after okay. the, the the you know I mean then there's some question about whether it continues as an individual or not it's it's all complicated but I mean but according to Thomas there's there's just one substantial form in matter that makes something a human body and it consists of the human soul taken together so um, um so, like on the one hand, that that's that that body is not something that could exist on its own, right? That is generic body without any specific form can't exist on its own. Whereas the soul can exist on its own, although Thomas says it yearns for its body, right? Because it has these components that need an organ to function properly. So uh, that explains why resurrection is in the flesh is desirable. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, anyway, um, whereas the early medieval people are like more like tend to be more like Plato, right? That the, like we're happier without all this stuff. <laughs> but but they all agree that the that the human body can't exist without the human soul. Where the, so that whereas the angel's body, I mean, this is substance dualism as. as in, in the sense we see that about the hu about humans in Descartes, right? The angel's body is a complete substance in itself. Mm -hmm. right? Thomas says it's made out of condensed air. <laughs> Which I love. But anyway, it's, <laughs> it's made out of air that God has made denser and put and colored, right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, like yeah, the human body is a body is a perfectly good body. I mean, sorry, the angel's body is a perfectly good body and it could exist without the angel having any connection to it. Okay. And similarly, obviously, the angel can exist without it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the angel has a use for it. That is, so it's, it's more than just the angel can move it around. It does something for the angel. And what it does is represent the angel. And it's basically the same theory of prophecy only now put into the world, right? So that this is exactly the point where Thomas says, just as in the scriptures, we see intellectual truth translated into images so that the, you know, the common people can understand them. So too, God can create an actual body that is an image of an intellectual thing. And um, and that's what happens here. So the angel, the assumed body of the angel is a body that somehow symbolically represents the angel's intelligible nature. That's one side. Then there's another side, which is the question, um, how does the angel 
no particular bodies. Right? How does it um, know about them, cognize them, whatever? Um, so, like the way we know about particular bodies is through our senses, according to Aristotelians. And you know, it's the 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 forms that we receive to our intellect by way of the senses are universal. So our knowledge is only about universals, strictly speaking, our scientia, right, is about universals. This is something Aristotle says, and, and uh, um, lots of people after Aristotle say. Um, so our knowledge, strictly speaking, is all about universals, but we have a kind of knowledge of particulars. We're able to apply these universal forms to particular cases because we're familiar with particular bodies through our senses, right? And our, you know, and our, our senses obviously receive not the, not only the universal characteristics of other bodies, but their accidents, um, including, you know, the accidents of place and time, right? I mean, our senses are affected at a particular place at a particular time. That's enough to individuate bodies. But now, like the angel doesn't have senses. The angel doesn't have sense organs. So it might seem like the angel can only know universals or can know particulars, but only in a weird way, like a weird universal way, right? So those are two opinions that Thomas first discusses and rejects. Um, but the angel doesn't know particulars at all. Well, also, he also discusses the, the view that angels somehow know them through senses. He says that's that's false and absurd, right? That they don't know them at all, that's like heretical, basically. I mean, the angel has to be able to know who Abraham is in order to interact with Abraham and so forth. So, uh, and then Avicenna's solution that, that the angel knows particulars through universals, Thomas says is still not sufficient. So how is this gonna work? So he says, um, let me erase this thing, let me erase this thing. I've sometimes thought about giving a seminar on angels and prophecy in, the, in medieval philosophy. <laughs> the problem is it would be a ton of work because I would have to like find all the texts and like probably translate some of them. So that's what always kept me from doing. <laughs> but anyway, um, because as you're about to see, it's totally crucial to understanding early modern philosophy. <laughs> Okay. So, um, um, right, so how does the angel know? So Thomas says, well, why is it that we can only know universals? That's the first question. So here's the human intellect. And it's going to contain uh, some kind of effect. So, okay, so it's going to contain something that somehow uh, is similar to or resembles this body. So first Thomas says, well, that can only happen if like two things become assimilated to each other, either because one causes the other or because they're both effects of the same cause. So in this case, we know it's supposed to go this way. The body is supposed to cause a form in the human intellect that's going to resemble it, or rep, you know, uh, I guess he doesn't really use the word represent at this point. I think he would, but anyway, so um, well, maybe he would. I don't know. Anyway, so it's supposed to cause this form in the human intellect, and Thomas says, well. Um, since the, the active part of the body is, is its substantial form, right? That's where it gets its power to cause things, but it has that in common with every other body of the same species. 
what it ends up causing in our intellect is only the universal form of its species. I mean, obviously you need to say more about this to explain how like it's, it also causes, naturally causes accidents, which then cause accidents in our sense organs. And that's how it affects us as a particular. But, um, but like those sensible accidents don't reach the intellect. All that reaches it is the universal form of the body. But on the other hand, he says, so here's the divine intellect. Why can I still have it? I'm going to assume. Here's the intellectual form and the divine intellect. Of course, the divine intellect is actually absolutely simple. So, but never mind. We think of it as containing forms, right? So, here's the intellectual form and the divine intellect. How does this thing come to, come to resemble it, where the causation goes the other way? Right? So, God's knowledge causes its objects rather than being caused by them. And because of that, Thomas says, it's able to cause not only the form, but also the matter. And the matter is individual to this body. And that's so God can know the individual body. This, this in itself is a solution to a complicated problem, right? Because a lot of people also said that God doesn't know particulars, but only knows universals. <laughs> but, but that just, by the way, he's solving that problem. But now the angelic intellect, How does this work? So he says, it's the third alternative. <laughs> both are caused by one cause. And what they're both caused by is God. So there's no direct causation between them. Just like in Leibniz, right? There's no direct causation between these. Um, um, how does it work? And he says, and it's it's basically the exact like it's this relationship turned the other way around. God causes an intellectual form in the angel that's suitable to represent the individual body. Right? So just as the angel's body or the image in the mind of the prophet was. Uh, but well, now let's take the angel's body. Just as the angel's body is a body that God created that's suitable to represent the angel's intelligible nature so that humans can interact with it. Um, the, um, the angel's knowledge of those humans and other particular bodies is an intellectual form that God created in the angel's intellect that's suitable to represent those sensible individuals. Right, so in other words, this relationship here, again, this is representation. And again, Thomas uses that word representation. Okay, so now we're getting to what Leibniz is gonna do with this. Are there questions about Thomas Aquinas or angels or anything before I go left? <laughs> All right, so um, to remember the problems that Descartes had with individuation of bodies, right? What makes this one body and this a different body? So, I mean, angels are individuated. Again, we didn't see this part in Thomas Aquinas, but we saw Leibniz quoting it, actually. Or, or citing it, angels are formally individuated. Each one is a different species from the others. That is the, the, the proof that Spinoza gives that two substances have to differ from each other in attribute and not just in accidents. Like Thomas already thinks that's true for angels. Uh, and um, so, so there's no problem about what makes one angel different from, a, from another angel, because they're always different kinds of angels. So they're clearly not the same. So why don't one want to say that about bodies? 
Well, on the one hand, extension, um, um, the whole, ex, ex, what extension is, is a potentially divisible continuum. Right, there's like continuous quantity, but it can be divided. So can be divided means that divided anywhere and the pieces you're left with are still extended. So extension is, is um, homogeneous. It's like absolutely homogeneous. Wherever you divide it, you still have the same thing that you had before on both sides of the division. Um, so like that's the whole idea of extension. So obviously, if you say that, that all there is is extension here, then you're going to have trouble explaining what the division is. Yeah. What is the word like right behind uh, your last shoulder? Like uh, between the two, this yeah. representation. <laughs> so you think some someday I should learn how to write clearly in the blank. <laughs> no, I mean that must be something I could learn or practice. Maybe it's too late. Yeah, handwriting course. Handwriting course. <laughs> no, but I think it's specific. Well, no, actually, whenever I write, it's hard to read. So, but I think there's there's problems that are specific to the black one. But anyway. <laughs> Um, all right, so, um, so that's one problem. And oh, well, so, so, so what Aristotelians say is, oh, yeah, there's extension, but there's also other parts of the substantial form, right? So, like on this side, we have a you know, mouse and it has the in addition to the to the form of body, or in addition to the like. Again, this is the different Aristotelians explain this different ways. That's why I'm being kind of vague. But, but say, like, in addition to the part of its substantial form that is corporeity, that is the form of being a body, it has other parts, like the form of being an animal and whatever the specific difference of mouse is, right? And, you know, on this side, we have uh, the horse. So <laughs> it's the big mouse. <laughs> A small horse, but anyway, so, um, so um, but like, uh, but Descartes doesn't want to say that because these substantial forms over and above extension are occult, right? Like, we don't know what they are or why they have the effects they do. Again, like, if we stuck with the older theory of substantial form that we saw in Porphyry. Um, maybe this wouldn't be such a big problem. Like Porphyry thinks we can actually sense the substantial form and know what it is. Like we understand why fire heats because we feel the heat that constitutes a substantial form. But according to Avicenna and everyone after Avicenna, we don't know what the substantial form is. All we know is its effects. So that makes it a cult. And that means that rationalists think that you don't know what you're talking about when you when you mention it or use it to account for things right because you're 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 saying like this thing a accounts for b but i don't know what a is and i don't see any and or i don't see any connection any logical connection between a and b so you don't mean that it accounts for b <laughs> like you're not thinking that right so occult forms is no good so like, um, um, so that's one problem Descartes has. And another problem Descartes has that I didn't talk about so much because I, I think I got really rushed when I talked about the sixth meditation, but it should be kind of obvious that mind-body unity, right? Like, um, or just mind-body interaction, period, right? How is it that, you know, so Descartes says, how does my mind move or soul move my body? He uses mind and soul interchangeably. How does it move my body? Well, it wiggles this thing in the middle of my brain, the pineal gland, 
And when it wiggles, it moves the animal spirits and the animal spirits flow through the nerves and the, you know, and make the muscles contract and whatever. But wait, how did this happen? <laughs> right? Like, how can an immaterial thing push a body around? It doesn't exclude anything from space. So how can it push? Right. And and I, I think also I didn't get much talk, time to talk about this in Spinoza, but Spinoza makes a lot of fun out of this, right? Well, not just fun, but he but he also, I mean, I think he's also like it's it's funny, but it's also incisive. He's like, so how strong exactly is it? <laughs> right? Like how much force does it take to resist it? There seems to be no way of measuring this against this. They're completely, they differ in attribute. They're completely different things. According to the same rationalist way of thinking, there's no way of seeing how one could be forced that way. Well, these problems, both of these problems can be solved. All we have to do is assume, number one, that we're all angels. Number two, that all angels have assumed bodies. And number three, that there's angels everywhere. <laughs> so it's a small price to pay to solve these problems, right? So, you know, so that, first of all, if you ask, like, um, um, what makes these two bodies different from each other? So the answer is this body is the assumed body of this angel. And this body is the assumed body of this angel. And these angels differ from each other in species. And they differ in a way that I guess Descartes thinks we understand, right? They differ in modes of thought. Um, so, um, so even though these two bodies are exactly the same in their nature as bodies, they're individuated by their connection to these two angels. And this connection is representation, right? So, um, and like, if you ask, um, it's not exactly the same as Thomas's angels because the motor thing has has like been absorbed by the representation thing, right? Right. That is, if if you ask, how does this angel move this body? Like, in what sense is it virtually present in this body? The answer is, God has created this body as suitable for representing this angel. So among other things, that means that its motions represent this angel's will. Um, now, like, on the other hand, if you ask, how do we know about bodies? Well, so, all right, so I mean, we've saw both the individuation and the mind-body unity thing. Uh, I, I guess, well, I guess we haven't solved the mind-body unity thing in the other direction, right? Which is that, that I didn't really mention, but also like, so according to Descartes, how do I know something about the world? Well, the world acts on my body, the animal spirits, the same story in reverse. That it moves the animal spirits, the animal spirits move around in my brain, they push the pineal gland, the pineal gland somehow wiggles my soul. <laughs> Again, very hard to understand. Here, replaced by God creates a form in the mind of this angel that's suitable to represent what's happening in its body. And then, since its body is affected by the other bodies, um, that's also how it can know about other bodies, right? So like this body has sense organs, you know, so like little corpuscles bounce off this body and hit this body's sense organs. And God creates a form in the mind of this angel that's suitable to represent that happening. Um, 
Um, but now um, we don't really need these bodies. Right? Just because I guess I should have said one more step. When I know about this other body that way, since again, since there's angels everywhere, so everybody is the assumed body of some angel. <laughs> um, when when I learn about this body, this is me. Let's say when I learn about this body, I'm learning about this body. So I get a form that's suitable to represent what this body did to my body. But what this body did to my body is part of its representing the mind of this other angel. So when this happens, this is what I'm really learning about is another angel. What I'm really learning about is another mind. I'm learning at it by, by the medium of these bodies. And there's so there's like, um, I think if you want to tell the full story, right? So like, let's say this, rather than an eye, put an ear here. <laughs> and here, put a mouth. La, 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 right? And so this body is saying, hey, hey, right? So like sound waves go out, they hit the ear of this body. So, so, so it starts with this body, with this mind having an image, plus somehow a volition is added to that, right? But having an image of the mouth moving in this way, or actually we don't intend our mouths to move, right? We just intend the sounds. We don't even know how our mouths make the sounds unless we're like phonologists. <laughs> Right. But anyway, so so somehow this angel has an image of this sound. Hey, hey. Um, God creates, you know, caused or because this body was created to represent this angel, when this body has when this angel has that image with this volition, this body actually makes the sound. The sound comes out, hits the ear of this body. And because um, this is my body, God creates uh, an image in me of the sound coming in. And so I hear, hey, hey, hey. And it happened by way of image translated to body, affects this body, translated back to image. So we don't really need the bodies. <laughs> right? It's... You can so, in other words, you can say everything is all angels, or you could say everything is all prophets. <laughs> but however you look at it, it's you know what's really happening here is um, that these minds are learning about each other, and not because of any direct causation that goes back one way and the other, but because God is up here creating all the. And of course, as Leibniz emphasized in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, that doesn't mean that God is like, oh, oh, it's time to create this, right? Like God said everything going to begin with, of course, right? So, like when we get to this time, the right images will come because of the internal laws of this. That's that's how these things change. They change by developing their internal nature. Yeah. Is that the folding that you talked about? Yeah, that's sort of the unfolding, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Unfolding or developing, right? Those mean the same thing. Um, yeah. Uh, so those angels are, uh, they're like immaterial, kind of like minds, right? Yeah. How, do they, how are they connected to the like extended bodies and all that? Well, so I just erased the extended bodies. Yes. <laughs> In this picture, there are no extended bodies. So, you know, what, so, uh, like, so the, the theme from the Leibniz reading this week was the relationship between monads and bodies. And, like, uh, I, I think, I mean, I've already said the main points of it here, and, but I think there's, um, in that moment of, like, first drawing the bodies and then erasing them, I was I was already presenting kind of like the two 
pictures that Leibniz uses. So like most of the time, even in the monadology, which is a pretty like uh, metaphysical text, most of the time he talks as if there are bodies and moments, right? So it's like Descartes or Spinoza, there's, there's like an attribute of thought and an attribute of extension or the world of thought and the world of extension. And then up here, there are monads. And down here, there are bodies. And then like the description of how everything works is gonna all have to do with the relationship between the monads and their bodies and other bodies. So I, I don't know what to call this picture, but this is like, the, I guess I'd say like the common sense picture. Um, and this is a false. It's, it can be given a, a true sense in which there is nothing false in it. But it is like you have to interpret it very quick, very carefully, <laughs> right? Which um, Leibniz um, usually doesn't force you to do because he knows that it will be easier to think about it if you if you keep this image of two different worlds in mind and think about the relationship between them. But on the other hand, there's the picture of like when he says something like in all metaphysical strictness. And in that picture, there are no bodies. Right, so it's just monads. I mean, I actually usually like to draw monads this way, where this is the time direction. So like each monad consists of an infinite number of passing states. And somehow there's a relationship of simultaneity between them. That's not really completely explained. Um, um, it's even possible Einstein was thinking about Leibniz when he started to worry about simultaneity. I'm not sure if that's, but um, okay. So um, so on this way of looking at things, the first thing you say is, well, there's a pre-established harmony between this realm and this realm. This, so this is kind of like Spinoza, right? The order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things, but not because there's a causal influence between them, um, but because, well, um, so in Spinoza, this is supposed to be logically, this, this harmony is supposed to be logically necessary. Right? It doesn't even make sense to call it pre-established for Spinoza. Um, it's, I mean, especially according to that explanation, although as I keep saying, there's some problems with it, but especially according to the explanation of the scolium to Proposition 7 of Book 2 of the Ethics, um, these things are kind of like two different ways of looking at the same aspects of the divine essence, and so they necessarily uh, always go together. But even like without that, there's, um, because of axiom four of book one, I think it's axiom four, that a cause can, that an effect can only be conceived through its cause. Like the order of causes and effects down here is gonna be exactly parallel to the order of ideas up here, right? So it's it's logically necessary according to Spinoza. In Leibniz, 
it's no longer logically necessary, or it's again, not logically necessary, I guess you might say. Um, and so um, when we ask why these things proceed in the same order, the answer is um, that uh, they, they, they could not, right? That is, it's metaphysically possible for these monads to um, have all kinds of perceptions and um, volitions and whatever. Um, and it will seem to them that they're interacting with the world of bodies, but actually the world of bodies is doing something else. Um, but we know that's not the case because God is not a deceiver, right? So the God is not a deceiver argument has come back. I mean, it's kind of in Spinoza, but it's come back in a big way here. It's being used, so on this picture, it's being used epistemologically to explain how we can know that there are bodies. I'm emphasizing that because in the other picture, it's going to be used metaphysically rather than epistemologically. Um, but here it's being used, right? We can know there are bodies because we have perceptions and God is not a deceiver. Right, so God causes representations in the minds of these monads that are fit to represent these bodies, and God wouldn't do that unless the bodies were actually there. And now these bodies are infinitely divisible. In fact, not only are they infinitely divisible, which is what Aristotelians say, Leibniz says. They're, they're infinitely divided in act. That is, they're actually divided infinitely. But none of the infinite parts is of zero extension. Right? That is, within each part, there are smaller parts. And within the smaller parts, there are smaller parts. And within the smaller parts, there are smaller parts. But no matter how far you go, those parts are still bigger than zero size. I mean, it's the problem of the composition of the continuum turned backwards and, and used for profit, right? Like, like, no matter how many points you add together, since they're all zero extension, you, you always get zero extension. But if you go in the other direction, the same thing works in your favor, because no matter how many times you divide the body, you never get to zero extension, <laughs> right? So all these parts have a certain size. And each part is a machine. So the, the big body, but the big body is presumably the part of an even bigger body, right? But anyway, the big body that we start with is a kind of machine, right? Its parts um, work together to do something. What do they do? Well, they represent the monad that is their mind, or if it's, it might not be a mind, the monad that is their intelligence, <laughs> right? So the way this body represents the infinitely complicated structure of the passing states of this monad is by an infinitely complicated machine. <laughs> um, and But each of its parts is also a machine. And each of the parts of the machine is also a machine, right? So Leibniz says, this is the difference between human machines and divine machines. That in a human machine, this is a very bad picture of a mule, but... <laughs> But in a human machine, eventually you get down to a part that's not artificial, right? Like the parts of this are not like, um, we're not made by humans for a specific purpose. They don't fill a, a role in the functioning of the machine. Only this thing as a whole does. So when you get smaller than this, the parts are no longer machines. They're just natural bodies, right? Like they, it's just like a piece of iron or whatever. But in a divine machine, no matter how small you get, every part is, is like consists of smaller parts that are working together to make that part what it is. 
<laughs> um, and it's it, it's a machine because again, like this, the monad's not making it do this. It runs by itself. Um, but it runs by itself by pre-established harmony. The way it runs by itself is exactly the right way to represent that moment. And that's why, like, when I want to move my arm, my arm moves. Because that whatever change happens in my mind that consists in wanting my arm to move is paralleled by a change in this machine down here that moves the arm. <laughs> And, you know, I, I mean, like, as we saw in Spinoza, it's not the case that this machine always consists of the same parts, right? This machine actually takes in parts and excretes parts, you know? So it's it's always the same machine, right? Because you can, you can replace part of a machine with an equivalent part that has the same function and it will still be the same machine. <laughs> so, so that's what happens here. It's it's very much like what Spinoza says about composite bodies. Um, so right, so that's a way of saying that these these smaller parts, although on the one hand they're part of this infinitely complicated machine, they're also each one is its own machine, and it will continue to work even after it's no longer part of this one. And finally, each one of these machines has is the assumed body of a moment. <laughs> so each one of them is, we can say, is a living thing with something like a mind, at, at least something very rudimentary that's like a mind up here, something that has perception and appetition. So another way besides talking about infinitely complicated machines is Leibniz talks about that if imagine that you have a fish and then when you look inside the fish, the, the fish itself is like a fish pond, <laughs> right? It's like if you look small, you see smaller fish moving around inside it. But unlike, so a regular fish pond, the water between the fish we think is, I mean, this is not true of a regular fish pond either, it requires a lot of this, but we think of the water between the fish as not alive, right? As unorganized. Mm -hmm. Right, this, this Greek word means tool. That's what organized means, right? So like when Aristotle talks about the or, an organic body, he means a body that, that functions like a tool for the soul. And um, I think I mentioned this before when I talked about Descartes. The type of tools people have in mind have changed though, right? The type of tool that Aristotle talks about is an axe. The type of tool that Descartes and Leibniz are thinking about is like a watch. Right. So anyway, so right, so we think of the water in between the fish as inorganic, as not the organ of any soul. But actually, Leibniz says, if you looked closer, you would see smaller fish swimming around in, the, in, in what looks like the empty water. And if we looked even closer, we would see even smaller fish <laughs> swimming around in, the, in what looks like the empty water between those tiny fish. Right now, so obviously, this is inspired by the discoveries made with the microscope. Right when you look. And a living thing, you see that it's made out of what looks like smaller living things. You know, of course, it's not really true that if you keep looking, you'll see smaller and smaller ones. <laughs> I mean, how do we know that's not true? We know it's not true because we know it's not true because very small things are not bodies at all, <laughs> like atoms. Or, right, like it can't be little fish swimming around and talking. <laughs> uh, what? I mean, I'm totally out of my depth with this, but aren't there, what are they, forks? Yeah. And then 
Maybe there's something that makes us orcs. I don't know. This is out of my head. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say it's impossible. I Because I mean, I feel like every time they're like, well, this is the smallest thing, then they just find a smaller thing. Right, but what I'm saying is that the, the, the quote-unquote small things are not, not bodies. They're not that they don't have a they don't have a definite position and momentum at the same time for example <laughs> uh, so uh, like um i mean there is this science fiction novel i read where it turns out that there's like creatures that live inside protons and they figure out how to like turn the proton inside out and come out of the proton and become big and invade the earth. I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, I, I don't know if it's impossible. They, but as far as we know, it's not true, right? When we when we looked farther, we didn't see that the, the big cells are also made out of trillions of smaller cells. They have substructures, but the substructures are not like living things on the world. All right, anyway, it's not worth arguing about that because I'm just talking, uh, like, as far as liveness is concerned, you know, yeah, if you make, if you could make the microscope more powerful, he thinks he can show a priori that eventually you would see these smaller fish floating around or swimming around. Um, So that last thing, namely that 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 every body that every body is the assumed body of some monad. So obviously Descartes doesn't agree with that, right? Descartes thinks that's only in the case of the human body is there this special relationship between a corporeal substance and a, a thinking substance, an extended substance and a thinking substance. But Spinoza, remember, already said this also, right? That every body, that that every body is the body of some mind. Um, but then there might be a difference, and this is what I hesitated about when I was discussing Spinoza. So, like, according to Leibniz, go back to the body being infinitely divisible in act that is actually infinite. Sorry, infinitely divided in act that is actually divided into infinitely many parts. Um, it's, it's not the case that it's divided every possible way into infinitely many parts. There's one right way to divide it, right? That's, I mean, that's kind of a consequence of, of its organization. Right, I mean, that's like what we're familiar with with, with regular old living things that have organs. Right, that yes, they have parts, but some of the parts are are parts of that living thing, and others are not. I mean, not that is some of the parts are organs, and others are not. Right, so like if you you know if you take if you consider like half of someone's heart and a piece of their lung. That's a part of them qua body, but it's not a part of them qua living thing. It's not part of their organism. Just like in a machine, right? Like in, in, in a machine, you know, at some given time, the, the, the gears are interlocking like this. So, I mean, this is a part of the machine qua body, the part that's inside this lock, but it's not a part of the machine qua machine. Right, it's not one of the machine's parts. There's a right way to divide a machine into parts once you know what machine it is and what it's supposed to do. And we know what machine this is because it represents this, right? So that gives us a like unique correct way to divide it into parts. And that explains why, like, why when Leibniz it talks about everything being organized and everything being animated. He goes to this like kind of fractal picture, right? That is, he doesn't say, you know, here's some fish in a pond. He doesn't say like, oh, this blob of water here, this also is a living thing and it's also organized. You just don't see its organs or something like that. No, this blob of water taken at a whole is 
inanimate in the sense that it's like an aggregate of different machines that don't go together to make a single machine. You have to look closer or presumably you could zoom out further <laughs> and eventually you would see the big animal <laughs> that the fish pond and the whole earth and whatever are somehow part of. He doesn't talk about that very much if at all, but it seems to be involved in this picture, right? That not only could you go down, but that also we must be part of some even bigger one. <laughs> um, so, um, but again, you have to do it the right way. So if you just take an arbitrary chunk of matter, normally you do have something that's not organized, or that's, that's dead, that's not, uh, that doesn't have its own mind. Because, but only because you've divided it the wrong way, right? Like you have to go in farther or out farther to, right? So, and what I'm not sure of is whether Spinoza agrees with that or whether Spinoza thinks any way you divide extension, right? Like all the possible ways of dividing extension into bodies correspond to a possible way of dividing the intellect into into ideas or something like that. I feel like Spinoza, it would be more like Spinoza to say the second thing. Right? That sounds more like, like Spinoza. <laughs> but he doesn't say either one clearly, so I don't know. But anyway, right, so this is how, that's how it works for libraries. So we've solved all those problems, but again, I guess, well, first of all, these things are kind of superfluous. And second of all, we haven't exactly solved the problem of the composition of the continuum. Because these things, qua bodies, we can still ask, what are their simplest parts? And they have to have simple parts, according to that argument that Leibniz makes in like one sentence at the beginning of the monodology and at greater length elsewhere that you can't have a composite that's not made out of simples. It would be nothing. And yet there can't be a simple body. So, um, so these bodies are on the one hand are superfluous and on the other hand are still causing a problem. And so therefore this is the real story. There are no bodies. <laughs> well, I mean, that is, there are no extended substances. So if that's what you mean by body, there are no bodies. I mean, of course, if that's what you mean by body, there's already no bodies according to Spinoza. Um, and in a way, as far as bodies go, this is going to turn out to be, that's not exactly like Spinoza, but it's similar to Spinoza in that what we call bodies end up being accidents of some of a substance, not substances themselves. Namely, they end up being modes of thought. <laughs> um, so on this so like on this view, monads are present virtually in space, as I explained before, right? Or they're present in space by representation. In this view, space is in the moments, <laughs> right? Like what is space? Well, like space is the way this monad perceives all the other monads, all the other simultaneous monads. And that's what you have to, you have to take for granted, it seems. Maybe Leibniz can explain it somehow, but it seems like you have to take for granted this relationship of simultaneity between states. And space is the way that um, the state of one monad represents all the other simultaneous states of the other monads. Um, and bodies are in space, that is, Bodies are images within that perception. But they're not, um, Leibniz says they're true appearances. 
or they're true phenomena. And he, he gives the example of a rainbow to help explain that, right? Because a rainbow is like, there isn't actually anything there, but nevertheless, like there, that is, there isn't a body there. But nevertheless, lots of people can see it at the same time, right? It's like, um, um, it's a reliable, intersubjective kind of appearance. It's not like a dream or a hallucination. I think uh, according to Leibniz and really even according to Descartes, this is, I think is actually is one of the things, well, it's one of the harder things to notice that changes in the course of meditations. That I think by the end of the meditations, Descartes thinks a dream actually is a way of representing the truth about bodies. It's just a weird way. <laughs> Okay, it's like Bertrand Russell says somewhere, explaining a similar theory. He says, a sea battle is the way a slamming door looks through the medium of a sleeping brain. <laughs> right? So like he's thinking, I mean, this is, I guess, is a super simple example. But right, he's thinking about how sometimes when you're dreaming, someone will slam a door. And in the dream, something will happen that makes that loud noise. But it might not be a slamming door. It might be a ship firing a cannon in the sea bottom. <laughs> right. So anyway, I think ultimately Leibniz thinks that dreams also are, are just part of the way this monad perceives all the other monads. But leaving that aside, so talk about normal perception of bodies. So like, so in what sense is that true? What, what makes this a true phenomenon or true appearance? Well, the answer is, of course, that all the other monads perceive what? They don't perceive exactly the same thing. I mean, because, you know, even when we're all looking at the same table, we each see something different. And moreover, if there's like monads like this that are much smaller than us, <laughs> um, they're not going to see the same shape at all. Right, because there's, you know, there's this thing has like tiny irregularities in its boundary that we can't see. But that is, that's the way we normally think about it. But the right way to think about it is that the perceptions of all the monads go together into one system. Right, so they correspond to each other. Create like a complete picture. Yeah, and Monet and Monet Leibniz actually says, you know, this is like the way, you know, uh, a single city is actually many cities because it's seen by all the different people in it in different ways. And yet all those appearances add up to appearances of one city because they correspond to each other in the right way. This, I don't know if this possibly could be partly a response to Descartes talking about how a city is best if it's built by one person versus, you know, I, I don't know. But in any case, right, so the, so like, so the, a body, what we normally speak of of a body existing means that there's this corresponding, there's a system of corresponding perceptions. And, um, how do we know that there's a such a, or not just how do we know, why is there such a system of corresponding perceptions? It's because God is not a deceiver. Right, so again, there's a pre-established harmony, but now it's not a harmony between monads and bodies. It's a harmony between all the monads. All their perceptions match up in a certain and all their perceptions, perceptions match up in a certain way because um, these perceptions are fit to represent what the other monads are doing. What are the other monads doing? Perceiving. <laughs> so these perceptions are fit to represent how all the other monads are perceived. And again, God wouldn't do that unless the other monads were actually there. Mm -hmm. Technically, it's because this is the best possible world. We'll see more about that in the last lecture next time. This is the best possible world 
So the best possible world doesn't contain, contain deceptions. It doesn't contain representations that where the thing represented is not there. Yeah. Uh, is each monad a mind, but not like necessarily a mind? Yeah. So each monad is like a mind. It has perception and appetition, at least. And then some of them also have memory. Those line that says are like animal minds. And then some of them also have reason, and those are like human minds. Um, and again, I think I'll talk about like the, the theme next time is going to be about like human will and freedom and reward and punishment and stuff like that. So then I'll talk more about that then. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, I think you like Susie Marsh Gibson, which is wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. They're not consistent with each other. Um, that's the one thing on the syllabus where I actually have to, because <laughs> I always made so many mistakes like this. I eventually set up a system so that, like, I don't write any dates in the file that generates the syllabus. There's like a script that puts in the right dates. So the dates will actually exist and they'll all be the same. And, but that's the one thing that doesn't fall into that system. And so, of course, I screwed it up. Um, um, so, um, yeah, I think what I told Edwin when he asked about this was, you know, like, obviously, you can hand it in at a later. Well, I mean, so one of the dates doesn't exist in the sense that it's like, it's actually a Wednesday and so it's a Tuesday or whatever. But anyway, you can hand it in at the later of the two dates, but you might want to get it in earlier to get feedback. You don't have to. So Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, oh, and I'm over time. That's probably why you're asking that. All right. So, no, I, but I think I got to everything important. So uh, I'll see you one more time next week. Thanks.